And now we've seen him at MassCon Houston. We've seen him all over social media taking the world by storm. Tonight we'll hear him speak at Plus One. From Palestine to the US of A, resilience and faith. We have Brother Sami Hamdi as we delve into the Ummah's historical and current dynamics and the contributions of American Muslims in addressing contemporary challenges. Brother Sami, on to you. Bismillah wa salatu wa Sayyidina Rasulullah. First of all, I want to push back a little bit on the introduction. First of all, I think it's important to note that everybody who's resonated with any podcast I did is not resonating with Sami Hamdi at all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Fatir, Man kana yuridu al-izzata falillahi al-izzatu jami'a. Those who seek glory, let them know all glory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you are resonating with is not Sami, you are resonating with your fitra that cries out for justice for Palestine. You are resonating with the Islamic duty to stand up for justice. Anybody who stands for justice, Allah elevates them. Anyone who abandons it, Allah humiliates. It's not Muslims that make Islam great, it's Islam that makes Muslims great. It's not Muslims who make Allah great, it's Allah who makes Muslims great. Allah is the one who elevates, Allah is the one who humiliates. Those who align with Islam and what it calls for, the natural consequence is that they are elevated in status. And the ones who turn away will be torn down and sent crashing down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same pace with which they rose to this. I am fully aware of this. This introduction was meant for me and not for you. A reminder that all glory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All favor belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I have been honored to have been some sort of a vehicle, even if it's a small one, at least to try to tell people that this ummah is not weak, has never been weak, has always had power, has always had the ability to manifest power. It just sometimes was a bit reluctant to use that power for a number of different reasons. You know, sometimes I think that comfort is not a really good thing for the ummah sometimes. And I've seen your houses, mashallah. <laughs> Allahumma la hasad. All I know is, uh, so my, my first time coming to America was 2018 for a wedding. And uh, when my friend told me that he'd do the wedding in America, I told him, Yechi, why would I go to the Eye of Sauron, Yechi? I have no interest in going to America. You know, you're going to make me go there. Why can't we do the wedding in London? Bring her here, Yechi. And out of all the women in the world, you couldn't find somebody except for America, Yechi. Yeah, subhanallah. Anyway, he told me that if I don't come to the wedding, because there were 400 of her and eight of us, so he said, no, I will never forgive you if you don't come. We have to make a splash when we go to America. And uh, yeah, 400 was quite daunting to look at. But when I came to America, second time November, third time December, fourth time January, fifth time will be March, inshallah. And then I promise I'll go away. You won't see me again. Uh, I went back to my flat in London and my flat is quite decent in London. And I entered and my wife said to me, how was America? I told her, oh, I feel claustrophobic in my flat. I told the stuff for Allah, like after you've seen what I've seen, you can't unsee it. <laughs> in terms of the topic at hand, one of the hardest things about repeating the same thing over and over again in different places is how do you do it in the same way, in a different way, in a way that's received? I've seen some people comment, they say Sammy says the same thing over and over again, but in different ways. And that Sammy, bro, you need some new content. So, and, and the thing that shocks me about it is that I never knew that Haq had, was content, like that it was just a, a trend that you just do as if you just got bored of talking about Gaza and now talk about something new or, or they got bored of what Haq is and now they want a new version of Haq. You know, they liked Haq, now it should be Haq X or Haq Neo X, Neo Haq. And you know, Astaghfirullah al-Azim, you know, you think about it, the Quran has been the same for 1400 years. Nobody said, you know, Astaghfirullah al-Azim, Allah, we need new content, Astaghfirullah. No one says it. No one says that Hadith should be changed by Bukhari and Muslim. Why? Because your heart resonates with what is haq and the fact that haq has to be repeated means we haven't done enough in terms of the haq and that's why it needs to be repeated until it actually gets implemented first and foremost. So I'm going to say the same message again and it, I don't care if you've heard it before, it's just the way it is and inshallah it inspires the same way it inspired before, inshallah, if it inspired before. Listening to the testimony of Yumna Patel and describing her colleagues and the like, the reality is you can feel it even in the way she tells her story. The sense that, that, not fatigue, but the sense of please hear my story. Please talk about Palestine. Please raise awareness. Please don't get tired. Please don't get fatigued. And the reason why that's a terrifying thing for her to say is, is the notion that the ummah can feel fatigue for standing up for Palestine and standing up for justice. 
But the reality is that I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing to feel the fatigue. And I'll explain exactly what I mean. First of all, let's appreciate what we've managed to achieve so far. When Israel began its genocide and ethnic cleansing, remember Blinken was banning the State Department from using the word ceasefire. Netanyahu was given a carte blanche just to go and attack the Israelis. Biden wanted to facilitate ethnic cleansing on the 20th of October. He proposed a bill to Congress to, oh, I forgot. The views expressed by the speaker reflect the speaker alone and do not reflect the organization that invited me. They did not ask me what I would say. I would, did not tell them what I was going to say. What I say is me and it has nothing to do with anybody associated with this organization. And I mean that seriously. Please record that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, very, that, that's a very, very important disclaimer. So Biden on the 20th of October decided to put a bill in Congress where he wanted to offer money to Jordan and Egypt to take in Palestinian refugees. He felt that the reason why Egypt and Jordan weren't taking Palestinian refugees is because of the, the money issue, you know, miskin ma'adush flus, doesn't have money. So uh, one of the things that I found fascinating about the Congress bill is, now I, alhamdulillah, had the opportunity in November to go for the first time to wonderful blue sky, sunny LA. And when I landed in LA, of course you do the convention in your speech, but you know, the five-year-old inside you wants to see what you saw in the movies. I want to go see, you know, Beverly Hills Cop, I want to see Beverly Hills. I saw these other movies, I want to see Hollywood. I want, I want to see that, that wooden letters that you guys have on the hill, you know, H-O-L-L-Y-W. When I went and saw it, I said, is, is that all it is? But it was exciting to me when I first landed in LA. And, and the thing is, when I went to LA, when I went to Beverly Hills, when you go to Beverly Hills, you think, okay, this is cool, this is Beverly Hills. But when I turned up, I just found rows of tents and homeless people in the tents. Biden said that the money that Congress has, homelessness is not a priority. Genocide and ethnic cleansing is a priority. I could resolve homelessness, but why would I do that when I have the opportunity for genocide and ethnic cleansing? And what lunatic would solve homelessness when you have the chance to ethnically cleanse Gaza and hand it over to the Israelis? When I came for the wedding, for Abu Bakr's wedding, who married Dua from Raleigh, she transformed him, mashallah. So I, I came to retract my statement about why'd you go find an American? So she made him a better man, mashallah. Yes, I said Abu Bakr. So, <laughs> when I went to Raleigh for the wedding, there was a guy with us in the car while we were driving and he vomited. Now, one thing that we have in the United Kingdom, God save the king, is, <laughs> is that if I wake up in the morning and I go, <coughs> oh, that felt a bit chesty. I can call the doctor and say, doctor, I just coughed. And he'll say, so what? I wanna see you. Why? I wanna make sure I'm okay. Now these days, maybe you need to wait a week or something to see a doctor, maybe two weeks. But you go to the doctor and you can, without paying a penny, and you can say to the doctor, doctor, I coughed and I'm worried about it. And he'll say, why are you worried about it? I tell him I felt chesty. He goes, dude, it's just a cough. Just go home. I tell him, no, I looked on Google. They said it might be cancer. <laughs> I need you to do some tests. I need a referral letter to go to the hospital. And he'll write the referral letter just to get rid of you. But because it doesn't cost a penny, I have my peace of mind that that cough was just a cough. When Miskin, this brother in the car, was vomiting, he vomited the first time. He said to Mecha, you okay? Let's go to a doctor just to check it out. And his face looked horrified. He looked more sick at the suggestion than the vomit. <laughs> and then he vomited again. And then I looked at him, me and a, a Palestinian brother who came with me from London, Omar Abdel Hadi. He said to him, dude, you, it could be something serious. Uh, just go check at least, just to have your peace of mind. He said, no, and he vomited again. <laughs> it's almost as if the suggestion was making him more sick. And we said, okay, let's at least call an ambulance. And he said, no, you have to pay for an ambulance here. And I thought, what a stingy guy over $50, $100 to get an ambulance. He said, what do you mean $100? It's $1,000 to get an ambulance here. A'udhu <laughs> billah. God bless the NHS, the National Health Service. Biden said that the money I could spend to make sure that they could go see a doctor to make sure they're okay, the money is better spent on genocide ethnic cleansing. What idiot would spend money on healthcare when they can spend it on genocide and ethnic cleansing? It's a no brainer. So Biden presents it in Congress. But on the 28th of October, Biden comes out and says that we will no longer pursue the displacement of Palestinians. We will reject it outright. Now, I thought maybe Biden was, you know, because he claimed that he'd saw pictures of beheaded babies. 
And the White House, they panicked. They said, no, he didn't see it. He didn't see it. You know? But then I saw John Kirby and I saw, saw the other spokesman come out. So I said, yeah, it must be true. But there was a reason why they changed their minds. It was because on the 26th or 27th, there was a Gallup poll that came out that suggested that Biden was falling behind the Republican candidates in six swing states. Now, the reason they were concerned about these polls is because Biden was falling in the polls, not because necessarily because of the economy, but according to Reuters, one thing that I'm aware with Muslims is, I'm aware that Muslims that we suffer sometimes from inferiority complex. So if somebody who looks like you says it, you won't believe it. So I need to bring you sources that in your mind is almost equivalent to Bukhari and Muslim. So I'm bringing you Washington Post and Axios from the Israelis so that you don't say Sami said it. So Reuters, Salam Alaikum. <laughs> so Reuters reported that the fascinating thing about the Gallup poll was that Biden was not falling in the polls primarily because of the economy. He was falling in the polls over his stance with regards to Israel and Gaza. But they said the shocking thing about him falling in the polls because of Israel and Gaza is that he was falling in the polls over a foreign policy issues where American troops weren't even on the ground. Usually when a president is falling in a foreign policy issue, it's because our boys are dying in places where we can't even point to on a map. This time, Biden was falling in the polls over a foreign policy issue where American troops weren't dying. So what was making the American change their mind over Palestine and Israel was nothing to do with the self-interest that our boys are dying abroad. It was because they were hearing the Ummah. Ah, that's a pathetic roar, but it is what it is. They heard the Ummah roar. They heard the Ummah roar. Oh, ahsant, ya bunay. Well done. But it was literally a very loud roar, and I explained to you why. So one of the things, I asked one of those tech guys, now I'll be honest with you, when my sister told me to set up a TikTok account, I told her, A'udhu Billah. I'm gonna spend my nights scrolling through videos of people doing new dance techniques and stuff. What do I look like to you? I'm a sophisticated individual. So I didn't say that, but in any case. So anyway, she told me, no, it's the future, it's how things will go. They're like, so I reluctantly set up a TikTok account. Now one thing I noticed with TikTok is, the TikTok algorithm creates a bubble for you. So for example, your TikTok account is not the same as mine. Mine is Ronaldinho, Zinedine Zidane, it's Haaland complaining he didn't win the Ballon d'Or. You know, it's a, a, a motivational speaker, this African brother who goes, bro, don't lose hope in Allah, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, and I, he's really good, mashallah, honestly. And maybe some cartoons here and there, Tom and Jerry, you know, from back in the days, and, and a couple. Somebody's TikTok might be, you know, Love Island, Kardashians, Kanye West, and that kind of stuff, you never know. The point is, TikTok creates an algorithm that's specifically dedicated to what you like. It doesn't show you what you don't like. And everything that you continue to post ends up increasing. For something to break that algorithm, it can't just be popular. It has to be so stupendously popular that it pops the bubble of the algorithm and forces itself onto the homepage. It has to make the algorithm not just giddy and excited, it has to make it in an ecstasy that it has to put it on your feed because it's so popular, it's being shared so much, it's being commented on so much, everybody has to see what this latest trend is. Alongside TikTok's algorithm, you have Elon Musk. Now, I know many of you are upset with Elon Musk as well the statements that he's made, that his name might be Jewish and he might be Jewish here and his mum might be Jewish and, you know, Tesla might be Jewish. No disrespect to our cousins, it's, the interview's there, everybody can see it, so I didn't say anything wrong. The views expressed are the speaker's own and don't reflect the organization. But one thing Elon Musk, so when Elon Musk took over Twitter, I saw many intellectuals, you know, they were like, this is a disaster for Twitter, like this is a huge disaster. Now I didn't exactly understand why, but because I saw intellectuals do it, I wanted to sound intellectual. So I also tweeted, oh, this is a disaster for Twitter. <laughs> and I couldn't understand, they'd be like, you know, I don't know, like freedom of speech or whatever, or, or you know, they'd be whatever, and I'd be like, oh yeah, freedom of speech or whatever again. I can't lie to you, I honestly believe that Elon Musk taking over Twitter was one of the greatest days in the lives of social media. And I explain what I mean. Elon Musk did something, I don't think he intended to do it, but it ended up that way anyway. He introduced something called the homepage. So before when you go on Twitter, you used to see only the accounts that you follow. This time he included the homepage, so when I opened X, I'll show respect X. When you opened X, I was seeing tweets of accounts that I don't follow. It was very strange. I was seeing Love Island. I was seeing Kardashian divorces Kanye West. 
I was seeing and things that I'm not uh, genuinely, I don't follow this stuff. I, I was shocked by what I was seeing on the homepage. The homepage is a compilation of tweets that are popular that X thinks you will like. And it judges that based on the number of people who are talking about a particular issue and it puts that issue on the homepage. For something to break the algorithm of X or algorithm of TikTok, it has to be so stupendously popular. The roar has to be so loud <laughs> that it breaks the algorithm and forces the content onto their home pages. So on the 27th of October, when they saw the Gallup poll and they saw themselves falling behind in the polls, there was only one reason why Biden was falling in the polls. There was only one reason why Americans were changing their mind. There was only one reason why there was this unprecedented shift. There was only one reason why suddenly Blinken was panicking and was going to shift from no ceasefire to humanitarian pause. And that's because the Ummah roared. And they kept talking about Palestine in such a way. Hashtag Palestine was not shared in the millions. It was shared first by the Palestinians, by Yumna Patela Mondawais and her colleagues and the Palestinian colleagues. Then it was amplified by 1.9 million, not million, billion. 1.9 billion Muslims were amplifying the hashtag Palestine. The algorithm got so excited that when Paul, Michael, Sarah, Joe, Jeremy and these others and opened up their TikTok or they opened up their ex, they no longer saw the latest Kardashian craze or Love Island or like. They saw first tweet, Palestine, first video, Palestine, second video, Palestine, third video, Palestine, because all the algorithm cares about is what's popular. And what was popular at that time or what was the main issue was that billions of people around the world were talking about Palestine, which resulted in Biden dropping in the polls in the six states, swing states, and it's as if because the Ummah took one step, Allah took 10 and made it so that the swing states where he was falling behind weren't just any swing states. It was swing states where Muslims have the deciding vote. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said a hadith that I used to read when I used to grow older and I can't lie to you, I used to read this hadith and only think of it from a spiritual perspective. You know sometimes you read a hadith and you think, oh, you don't truly understand it, but you're like, Allah. Because it makes you feel good. You read, for example, بَلِّغُ anni walaw aya. Convey from me, even if it's just a verse, so you come out of your house and you go, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أحد. Without understanding that the structure of the hadith is where the secret lies. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, بَلِّغُ anni walaw aya. Convey from me, even if it's just a verse. The point of this hadith is in the walaw, even if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was saying, don't be an ummah that is quiet. Don't be an ummah that does nothing. Don't be an ummah that says it doesn't have the ability to do anything. For wallahi, if, if you can't convey anything, convey at least an ayah. Don't be an ummah that says nothing. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said, من رأى منكم منكرا فليغيره بيده. He who sees something that is wrong, or she, because I know I'm in America, this gender thing is a really big issue for you guys. <laughs> Whoever sees, <laughs> listen, I've never been asked about pronouns in the UK, only in the US. That's all I'm saying. It's a very American thing that you guys are exporting. Please leave it within your own borders. <laughs> the views expressed by the speakers. Oh, my pronouns are he and are he and Sammy. That's my pronouns. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I just realized I need to be careful when I'm saying <laughs> The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever sees something that is wrong, let them change it with their hand. But if they cannot, not if they don't want to, if they cannot, implying that you do not have the power to change it with your hand. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the structure of the hadith, if you do not have the power, the same way we feel we do not have the power to actively go and stop it, then he said, then let him change it with his tongue, meaning speak out against it, put pressure on it, condemn it, shout loud about it, tweet about it, do, just keep talking about it. If he cannot with his tongue, then let him condemn it in his heart and that's the weakest of faith. The Ummah believes that speaking out doesn't make a difference. Let me retract that. Some in the Ummah believe 
that speaking out doesn't make a difference. That what am I doing? I'm speaking out, but there's a genocide still happening. I'm speaking out, but it's not making a difference. I'm speaking out. All I'm doing is speaking out. I wish I could do more. But here the Prophet is saying that speaking out is an elevated form of resistance. For he didn't say that was the weakest of faith. He said to do nothing and condemn it in your heart is the weakest of faith. To be an ummah that does nothing puts you at your weakest. To be an ummah that doesn't move puts you at your weakest. To be an ummah that chooses not to mobilize makes you the weakest. But any action, even if it's speaking out, elevates you in the level of resistance. When Biden is falling in the polls in the six states where the Muslims have the decided, and of course, I remember inferiority complex. If Sami says it, it's not believed. So I bring you Axios, the Israeli paper. They said, if Biden loses even a sliver, their words, not mine, a sliver of the Muslim vote, he loses the election. Political vote, if Biden loses 100,000 from Dearborn El Mubarak in Michigan, yeah. You know, may Allah bless them and give them the fortitude to do what is necessary. Views expressed are the speakers. Hey, 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 hey. Views expressed are the speakers own. They do not reflect anybody sitting in this audience or the organization that invited me. Yeah, come on guys, get with the page, get with the script. They said if they lose even 100,000 votes, Biden loses Michigan. The reason that poll was shifted is because the Ummah, such a pathetic roar. Maybe they roared and you didn't. Astaghfirullah The point is that as a result of the speaking out that you felt was insignificant, caused a significant shift that Blinken, according to Axios, went to Netanyahu and told him, Bibi, we got a problem. For those who don't know, Bibi, Bibi is Netanyahu's nickname. I'm not mocking him in any way. I'm just, that's his nickname. But may Allah never give me a nickname like that. But I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I take it, views expressed other speakers own. I have no idea what this is. So Blinken says to Netanyahu, he tells him, Bibi, we got a problem. Bibi tells him, what's wrong? He tells him, as a result of the Ummah roaring, we're now behind in the polls and we're concerned that these polls might actually hurt us. Now, we believe that these Muslims will forget by November because they've got Trump who do the Muslim ban. And the Muslim believes that if they had to choose between seeing their relatives and condemning a genocide, they would rather see their relatives rather than punish a genocide. So I know what these Muslims, but just in case they decide a genocide is worse, just in case they decide a genocide is worse than see, not seeing their relatives for four years, just in case we need a new marketing strategy. Netanyahu said, what's the marketing strategy? He said, look, I don't think we should be so loud about the genocide and pummeling Gaza and calling them animals and all this other thing. I think what we should do is we should do a marketing strategy to make ethnic cleansing and genocide look more humane, merciful. How do we do that? What we do is we send a letter to the Palestinians in their homes and we tell them, we, would, we are coming to take your land and bomb your home. But as a mercy, we give you four hours every day to decide whether you want to be in the home when we bomb it or whether you want to leave the home. And Bibi, what we'll do, we'll make them go through a humanitarian corridor under the protection of the Israeli army. The problem is, Netanyahu responds and he says, according to Axios. Netanyahu says, I need to know that this isn't a plan by Biden to lure me into a ceasefire. Allah says he thinks they, they, you are, they are united, but قلوبهم shatta, their hearts are divided. Because Netanyahu was worried. Netanyahu, who doesn't really rate the Muslims, said, Blinken is coming here after promising me that he won't call for a ceasefire. Blinken, as a result of hearing these Muslims keep talking about Palestine, breaking the algorithm and changing public opinion. Now Blinken, as a result of these Muslims, after he managed Blinken, Blinken, come on, we already got a fatwa from country S. You know, maybe I shouldn't go down that road here. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe I should just, but you know, Blinken had a fatwa from a, chief imam in one of the holy sites that said, don't talk about Gaza because it's fitna. He got the fatwa. And there was another country that said, you know, where Muslims like to go for some reason, they, they, that, that said that it's the Palestinians fault. And there's another country that said, we're not opening the border. And if you force us to, we'll just load the Palestinians on boats 
and send them to Europe and you guys can deal with it. Netanyahu said, surely these Muslim states, we have imams on our side. We have imams calling for pro-normalization as well. Why are you worried about this? Because the fatwa is not working on these Muslims. Because Islam is not like Christianity or Judaism. They don't need an intercessor with Allah. They can talk to Allah directly and Allah spoke to them directly through the Quran. They don't, go, they don't do confession. They do tawbah. They do tahajjud at night and do tawbah. They don't need an imam for that. You need to understand what this Islam thing is all about. Netanyahu says, I don't want to learn about Islam. He goes, well, you should. He didn't actually say that. So they go from not calling for a ceasefire to a humanitarian pause. But the Ummah refuses to be quiet. The Ummah puts the pictures of the Palestinians leaving alongside the Nakba. Not only that, have you ever seen, I know, I know there are many young faces here and I'm among the young faces, alhamdulillah. <laughs> I am, honestly, I am among the young faces, alhamdulillah ala fadli. So I'm asking the elders here, okay? Not myself. Have you ever seen a BBC presenter or CNN presenter apologize for their coverage of Palestine and, and Gaza? Why do you think they apologize this time? When the CNN reported about the beheaded babies 24 hours and then the presenter came out and said, I'm sorry that we reported it without corroborating evidence. Do you think that she apologized because she got a call from the White House and Biden said, how dare you drop journalistic standards? You should be fair and give the Palestinians their airtime. Do you think it's because Netanyahu said, come on, I know I'm committing genocide, but be fair to the victims. It's because they heard the Ummah. <laughs> Sheikh Ammar, I didn't say it, they said that. Huh? They heard the Ummah roar and the, they panicked. So they said, listen, forget what Biden thinks, forget what Netanyahu thinks. I'm worried about what these people think. Because these people were supposed to be quiet. They were supposed to keep their heads down. They were supposed to just take it lying down like they always do. They, was, they were supposed to be, listen, we don't want to bring trouble to ourselves. We don't want to struggle. We have lovely big houses. We don't want to jeopardize that. Bismillah, mashallah, Allah is Allah yazidkum, mashallah. May Allah increase you and, and, and increase me with that as well, inshallah. Anybody want to donate? Let me know. <laughs> so they apologized because the ummah was mobilizing. The reason why I'm giving you these examples is is to try to get you to appreciate the power that you displayed that I fear you don't appreciate. The reality is that when I see how the public opinion has shifted in America that makes a Zionist girl in LA say, I grew up in a Zionist environment, never seeing Palestinian content, but as a result of TikTok, say Amin. Listen, for those of you who didn't want to say Amin, let me put it to you this way. Would you have preferred BBC and CNN dominate the narrative? At least TikTok gave us a way to. Because when they asked TikTok to close down Palestinian content, why you promote Palestinian content? TikTok said, guys, it's not the algorithm. It's just the new generation is pro-Palestinian. But why are they pro-Palestinian? It's because the Zionist girl in LA came out. She calls herself Zionist, it's not me. She came out, she did a video. She said, I grew up never seeing Palestinian content. But as a result of TikTok, and the stupendous popularity of the videos of the Palestinians that were being amplified by the Ummah that was roaring and raising the voice of the Palestinians, that was raising the voice of the Palestinians, that was delivering it to the homepage of Michael, Matthew, Luke, John, Jeremy, Jeffrey, Michelle, Sarah, give me the names, yalla. John, Jen, J Jacob, all, the, all these other names, right? On all of their homepage, as a result of that shift that was taking place, we saw Blinken buckle, Netanyahu buckle, Biden buckle, and we even saw Kamala Harris come out and produce a video where she announced a new counter-Islamophobia initiative, the first ever in America, and also the Democrats, they sent out an email saying, yeah, they didn't say, yeah, but they said, I need to be careful there. They said, they, yeah, yeah, they said, I don't know why that came out, but in any case, they said, oh, Muslims, or maybe they don't even respect Muslims, they oh, Muzis. <laughs> you know, Trump, when he comes to power, he will do the Muslim ban. Remember how bad Trump is. We promise not to do the Muslim ban. The reason they did that is not because they, they were affected by the videos coming out of Palestine. They didn't see the, the pictures and the atrocities, the children having their limbs amputated without anesthesia. They didn't see the bombing of the hospitals and think, you know, these poor Palestinians or the like. They went, 
Good job, Israel. But the reason they did it is because the Democrats got together and they said, look, I'm not going to try the accent. It's a bit tough for the way they do their accent. I can't mimic it. But they said, look, these Muslims are getting angry and there's a chance they might punish us in the election. So let's throw them a bone that they can chew on that will help them to forget the genocide. And say, look, guys, yes, we might have committed a genocide, but the guy wants to do a Muslim ban. Like, how can you compare the two? And that's why it was very interesting to see a tweet by Hind Meki. I keep repeating this tweet everywhere. I mentioned her name to give her credit, so no one says I stole her idea. But because, because I sat there, I said, how do I address the fact that the other side is Trump? And then, subhanAllah, the next day I saw her tweet where she said, I'd like to inform the Democrats that, yes, while it's true Trump wants to put the Muslim ban, I'd like to remind the Democrats that we Muslims survived four years of Trump. 20,000 Palestinians did not survive four years of Biden. We survived the racist, bigoted Donald Trump. There are some people, I don't know, I saw online, they said Sammy's telling people to vote Trump. A'udhu billah. A'udhu billah. I know there are some Muslims who, who've been trying to convince me that Trump is good. I have no idea where they got that from. <laughs> Except uh, uh, somebody, but then in the end of the conversation, they say, I made more money under Trump than Biden. I get it. Okay, filus. It's like the video of the guy in Mecca going, Allahumma filus, 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 filus. And the guy next to him says, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana fi. He goes, yes, yes, but filus, filus mafi. <laughs> you know? So I understand that sometimes self-interest might guide somebody to one, one party over another. But the point that I'm saying is that you got to a stage where the Democrats are rattled by what? They're not rattled by any of the Muslim nations. They got a fatwa from a Muslim nation. They got a statement condemning the Palestinians from another Gulf nation. They got support to blockade Gaza from another Muslim nation. They even got somebody who's often called, a, a, I don't know, a, a sultan or, or sometime. They even managed to get him to be neutral in, in the whole affairs. And trade between the two countries actually increased 30% since the genocide. Although I read the report today that maybe the sultan is about to cut off an economic ties with Israel. 100 days, but you know, better late than never, I guess, if it's true. The point is... The Democrats didn't change their position because of any of these major Muslim states taking any stance. So what made Blinken buckle and go to call for a sustainable ceasefire or hostage truce? What made the drop in Biden's public opinion? What made all of this shift that is making everybody fall over themselves, that has made the Belgian Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, call for sanctions on Israel, made Spain state that it's ready to recognize a Palestinian state, make the US allies refuse to join this coalition in the Red Sea, that made Saudi Arabia finally lift the ban on making dua for Palestine. Oh, I mentioned in country by name, oh. The views expressed are the speaker's own. When these people land in Jeddah, please let them through the border. Wallah, they had nothing to do with me. I don't know them and I'm not moving to Houston just so they can do Umrah. Please let them do it. Yeah. We have our own gripe, but don't let them include it. This is between us. Stop. Stop. I hope your names aren't registered on this event. So. <laughs> the point here that I'm saying is an ummah that keeps telling itself it's weak brings about extraordinary changes at the highest levels of state. When I did the Yaqeen podcast, so I can't lie to you, I know that that podcast went viral, right? But I'll be honest with you, it's a tantrum, not an analysis. Because when they invited me for the podcast, I calculated the time difference wrong. So I thought it was 11 p.m. UK time, it turned out to be 3 a.m. UK time. So, and then, so I, lo I didn't know what to do. Should I go to sleep, wake up, but I might not wake up. So I stuffed myself with coffee and watched Korean dramas until 3 a.m. <laughs> They're really good Korean dramas, but in any case. And if you're married, if, if you're married, watch them with your spouse. It's a really good marriage, you know, takes you to the next level. <laughs> I'm serious, I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> so, in the, it, so, so when we did the Yaqeen podcast, they said to me that Sheikh Mikhail will speak first. And then we'll take Q&A and then Sami will speak. Now I thought, Yekhi, like it's 3 a.m. Why can't I go first and then go to sleep and then Sheikh Mikhail can, can finish off because it's earlier his time. So Sheikh Mikhail gave a wonderful, wonderful, like, mashallah, he's gifted, Allah, he barak, like he is, mashallah. And then they took the Q&A and, and the question was a horrible question. Let's be brutally honest. Are we in the West betraying Palestine? And I realized what she meant by the question. No disrespect to Sister Iman. I'm sure it was a sincere question. But the question effectively, how I interpreted it was, I feel like I'm betraying Palestine because the Muslims are telling me I'm not by speaking out. But I need a source other than Muslims to tell me that I'm making a difference. Because the Muslim source is here, I need Washington Post and Axios to tell me I'm making a difference. Inferiority complex. So I flipped. 
I said, you know, I, I know what she wants here. Fine. Yeah, Bint al-Halal. You don't want Sami to tell you. Here's Benny Gantz. Here's Netanyahu. Here's Blinken. Here's Biden. Here's the polls. Here's... And then I saw I had Zoom on my phone and it said, may Allah bless your tongue keep going. And I went, oh, tantrum turns, tantrum turns to be analysis. That's perfectly fine. The point of the Aqeen podcast is that later on when I wanted to see what it is that made people resonate with it, when I opened the Aqeen podcast, I saw IDF advert before it came up. And when I thought, Astaghfirullah, I need to make Tuhur, you know, like, because I saw the IDF advert, because I really wanted to see the podcast, so I watched the whole IDF advert. So, you know, the, don't judge me, I wanted to see the podcast. So I thought, let me listen to Saud al-Sharim, Surah Taha. So I opened Saud al-Sharim, Surah Taha. The Israelis spent so much money, it was as if they wanted the IDF advert to be the Bismillah before the Surah. Because it came up before the video, Surah Taha, Surah Saud al-Sharim. Phenomenal. The point is, I don't, know, I don't know if any of you guys have ever tried social media ads. I'm not particularly gifted at it. I tried it when I first started the international interest then realized I had no idea what I was doing. Because you know when you choose your countries and you try to make it targeted adverts, it just seems to charge you more and more and more and more and more. And if you try to do all the categories at once, it tells you you spend, I don't know, like $20 and you only reach like however much. You have to do concentrated targeting. For them to put the adverts on even the Quran and Yaqeen means they were spending billions on their social media advertising to promote their cause and promote the IDF. They were spending billions on a PR campaign that the Ummah broke for free. They spent billions on social media to propose a narrative and monopolize a narrative that the Ummah broke for free. The roar was so loud, it reached so far it smashed the Israeli monopoly for free. Pre-100 people received money for tweeting or for doing TikTok. No one received money, right? Can you imagine how much you'd have been paid if you did the Zionist propaganda? But you didn't want to take the money, did you? You want to do it for haqq and for truth. And you broke it for free. The reason why I'm saying all this is that today the Israeli PR met with TikTok influencers to now push the Israeli narrative once more. To try to retake control of the narrative. So they're paying more money to try to take back control of a narrative that you broke for free. The reason I'm highlighting all these small things here and there is to highlight the victory that you managed to achieve through just speaking alone. So imagine if you did other things as well. But the point I want to address after this very long introduction has less to do with the victories you've achieved and to address this fatigue, this word fatigue that keeps coming up in the Muslim community when it comes to Palestine. Now to be, to be serious now, I promise, no more joke. Maybe one more, but in any case. There were two books that I happened to read before Gaza happened, that if I had not read them, I would not have the opinion on Gaza that I have today. The first was one day I woke up and I was having a conversation with an Algerian friend. And I said, why is it the French never apologize for Algerian colonization? Like, why do they keep insisting? And he was like, Wallah, and Francis, Adoma, they have no shame, that's why. The Francis, oh Wallah, I don't buy anything from the French. I don't, he's, he's having a delicious yogurt, uh, French come. But he's like, oh, I don't buy anything from the French. Saddaqni khuya, their, their products are bad quality anyway. And I was like, ah, oui, yeah. Ah, no, ah, oui, yeah. Skin, Wallah. <laughs> but one day I decided, you know what? I thought, you know, why don't I try to buy a book by somebody who's sympathetic to colonizers and just read from their perspective why they loved colonization so much and how they think things could have been different. So I bought a book called Algeria, Savage War of Peace by a guy called Alistair Horn. So in this book, to be honest, is quite difficult to read because at every juncture, he's trying to justify why colonization could have survived if the French had just done this, if they'd just done that, if they just allowed a bit of Arabic, if they just allowed a bit of this, then they could have stayed, you know? If they just went easy a little bit on this aspect, they could have remained as colonizers. But in this book, he identifies two turning points in the liberation of Algeria. The first turning point he identifies was the establishment of the Council of Islamic Scholars in 1920s by a sheikh called Abdul Hamid bin Badis. Abdul Hamid bin Badis set up the Council of Islamic Scholars and set up an office in every city. And it would teach a new generation Arabic, Quran, Hadith and a fluency in the Islamic identity. And 30 years later, the graduates of these schools would be the foot soldiers of the FLN that would emerge 30 years later in 1954. He said this new generation that did not suffer from the battering of France. Because remember, France for 100 years, they tried to ban the Arabic language. They would line up the hijabis and they would remove the hijab and say, you are for liberty, you are free now to do whatever you wish. For those who want to know the, the savagery of the French, my great uncle was 19 when he was killed. 
One day, the, his cousin was pregnant, so she was walking on the street, and four French soldiers, they took out their knives and their machetes, and they said, yo, let's see what gender the baby is. So they went to cut open her stomach in order to get the baby out. He panicked, he saw, picked up a rifle, started shooting at them, they ran away. That night, they came into his room and they riddled him with bullets. French were nasty. The French, they used to bring people, electrocute them, they used to get horseshoe marks and dig them in, they used to get the woman, chop off their breasts, they used to do all sorts of things in the name of the civilizing mission, that is France. Abd al-Hamid bin Badis was pushing back against that battering by trying not to revive the identity, but restore the bridge that they were trying to break between the Algerians and Islam and the Arabic language. The second turning point that Alistair Horn identifies as the turning point in the liberation of Algeria was interestingly the massacre of 1945. For those who don't know, in 1945, when France was liberated from Nazi Germany, because they'd been defeated in two weeks by Germany, I'm just saying, in two weeks? <laughs> when they were liberated from Nazi Germany, all the Allies, Western Allies, got together to write a document. Every man is born free and every people have the right to self-determination. They came together, they said, this is, you know, the global order and how it's going to work and look how magnificent we are, freedom and self-determination. The French celebrated in Paris, but realized that there were Algerians who saw the document and went, Wallah al-Adim, ala balak, ada dokumo hada, mashallah. This, this document sounds fantastic. Freedom! Asma, yahdru ala freedom for everybody. It was self-determination. Ay, akhwe, hatta now I want some self-determination. So they saw this document, for those who understood, they said they have this document, self-determination, I want self-determination as well. So when Stif, Kharata and Galma, they took to the streets to protest and they said, we want liberation, we want freedom now. France was so horrified that Algerians would want freedom that they danced in Paris, they danced in Paris and then went and massacred 30,000 Algerians in that week. The French say they massacred 12,000 and that's them being quite, you know, okay, we, we, we killed 12,000, you know, whatever. No, it's fine, no problem. I thought you were going to tell me. Uh, uh. The Algerians say they massacred 50,000. Now I know some of my Algerian uncles, maybe, maybe, slight exaggeration, khalas. We'll go for the middle ground, 30,000. 30,000, huge number. Alistair Horn says this was the turning point. But the second book that changed my perspective on Gaza was the Quran and Surah Hud. So one day, you know sometimes, some of the shepherd will know this, you want to learn a longer surah to show off in front of your friends. You don't want to be the guy who just reads, Qul You want to be the guy who reads, you know, and everybody goes, I don't know this surah, mashallah. <laughs> like, like, my guy became a sheikh fam. Like, mash you know, really, like, you want to do it. So anyway, so I had one of those moments, you know. Not, they don't come often, but I had one of those moments. I read Surah Hud. So I read the first two ayahs of Surah Hud, made a mistake in the third. I read the fourth and fifth ayah, made a mistake in the sixth, and couldn't remember the seventh. So I gave up and just went, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> So I decided, you know, I've forgotten, you know, the surah and I've forgotten. Well, I need to go open the Quran, I need to go re-memorize the surah. As I'm going through the surah again, for the first time, I'm actually trying to understand what the surah is about. Nuh salam goes to his people, Allah destroys his people. Hud salam goes to his people, Allah destroys his people. Shu'ayb goes to his people, Allah destroys his people. Salih goes to his people, Allah destroys his people. I'm trying to find a nice way to say this. But as you're going through the surah, you're sort of like, la hawla wa la quwwata. There's not a single one managed to succeed in convincing his people. One by one. And then you get to Shu'aib. And then Lut. And then Lut, you get to a statement where Lut actually gets to a point where he says, when the people come to oppress him, he says, if only I had power or a powerful ally to resist you. And I can't lie to you. My immediate reaction was, how can a prophet say that? And then you remember, wait a minute, but in Surah Nuh, Nuh salam laments and says, Rabbi inni da'awtu qawmi layla wa nahara, wa lam yazidhum du'ai illa firara, wa anni kullama da'awtum li taghfira lahum ja'alu asabiyum fi adhanihim. After 900 years of giving da'wah says, Allah, I have called on my people day and night. And the thing is, when you read the ayah, I can't lie, you feel like Nuh is going, Allah, I've called on my people day and night. And every time I call on them, they run away from me. And when I call on them, so you might forgive them, they put their fingers in their ears. 
They cover their faces and they treat me with arrogance. When Hud goes to his people, they say, why should we follow your message? It's only these, the, 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 the worst of our society who follow you. And you're reading all this one by one by one. So when Gaza hits, my reaction is like Lot. If only I had power or a powerful ally to resist you. You start looking and thinking, subhanAllah, I don't have the power to achieve what I want. But you remember Surah Hud, that these prophets as well failed to convince all of their people. The question here is, do we say that these prophets failed? Why? Don't tell me, why? Don't tell me because you think it's haram. I know you because it's haram, but we think beyond haram. You, it's because you understand that the role of the prophets was not to deliver the outcome. The role of the prophets was to strive. The role of the prophets was to deliver the message. The role of the prophets was to mobilize. The role of the prophets was to move. The role of the prophets was to roar. The role of the prophets was to convey the message and take action in order to mobilize, in order to try to make the difference. But the outcome always belonged to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even when you notice some of the prophets, they don't say, Inna ma'ya Rabbi sayansurni, Allah will give me victory. They say, Inna ma'ya Rabbi sayahdeen, Allah will guide me. And the more, more you look into it, you get to this point where even Surah Al Isra, where it says, Woman arad al akhirata wa sa'ala ha sa'ya huwa mu'minun fa ulaika kana sa'yuhum mashkura. Those who strive in the way of Allah, wa huwa mu'minun, they believe in Allah. Meaning their striving is on the basis that they believe Allah is in charge of the outcome. And because Allah is in charge, therefore it's worth striving even if they cannot see the outcome. Because they know Allah is in charge of the outcome. Allah doesn't say the outcome is rewarded. Kanat al natija mashkura. Allah says, fa ulaika kana sa'yuhum mashkura. It's their striving that's rewarded. So when my wife came to me three days after the Gaza genocide began, and she said to me, Saraha Sami, Saraha Saraha. You're acting as if you're the only one whose heart is broken over Gaza. But you don't see me sitting around depressed in the living room. You're not helping with the hoover or the dishes or the cleaning or anything. So either get up and go record a video with analysis or help me with the dishes and the hoover. I thought I'll go record a video. <laughs> I didn't mean it in that way. I just meant, you know, I should do something. She was right, she was correct. I should go and do something. And when I came home, I, I did some dishes as well. You know, there's nothing wrong with it, guys. I'm not a red pill guy by any stretch of imagination. And may Allah forgive these red pill guys who made the brothers become very antagonistic towards our sisters. Brothers, a bit of game is good in, in, to, to, to train as well. You know, subhanAllah. Aisha used to say the Prophet used to play with Aisha. You know, some poetry would be good for some brothers to learn as well. You know, it, it works. Trust me, take it from me. I got married at 20. But, yeah, yeah, true, listen, true story. I saw, I saw my wife at university, we had this very controversial issue took place and I was like, I'm not getting involved because I don't want to cause fitna between the Muslim community. Let me wait till it dies down because they will get the liberals on their side and the student union will crack down on the MSA. And then I walked into the common room and Sumaya is wiping the floor with this other guy. And I said to my friend, I said, eh, 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 eh. what's her name? He said to me, why, do you like her? I said, this isn't the time for this, Sekhi. Just tell me what her name is. And then, because we were in university, or college, as you guys call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So she, 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 she walked into the college shop. And I saw her going, so I followed, and I wanted to, I was like, I'll go by a twitch, because Nick was in the football team. He was the shopkeeper in the, in the shop. So Sumaya put her stuff down and I put the twix and I went, Nick, it's all on me. And she went, excuse me? And Nick was like, oh, Sammy likes a girl. So I tried to talk to her for the next three weeks, but she would only talk to me a little bit like here and there, you know? It was like, Spandler, what's wrong with you? Just talk to me. Eventually, I did this. I said, you know what? I'm just gonna do istikhara about it. Ya Allah, either remove the feelings from my heart or give me an avenue forward. And I can't lie to you, you're doing sujood. Some people think istikhara is a sophisticated thing. My istikhara was simple. Allah, I don't want the istikhara where you give me a feeling that it's right. I know I'm undeserving, but give me a sign like you gave Musa alayhi salam. <laughs> or give me a sign like you gave Zakaria alayhi salam. Please Allah, I know I'm undeserving, but Allah, please. You said, you know, if I make dua, you respond to me. Allah, please. So, on the, so I would do two rakah after Isha, two, four rakah in the middle of the night. And two rakah before Fajr, very disciplined on this issue. On the eighth night, listen, I'm not a Sufi by any stretch of the imagination. And full respect to the Sufis, I'm not, I'm not saying anything. 
I'm just saying that on the eighth night, I saw a dream that the friend I asked about her brought me Qurbani for Eid and said, send me Idbah, Bismillah. And I went, Bismillah, Allah Akbar. And I woke up, picked up the phone, I called him, I said, go tell that Sumaya girl, there's a guy, Sammy wants to marry you. He said, dude, what do you think this is? 1500s, what do you mean uh, go and say it? I told him, Wallahi, she's gonna say yes. Anyway, my wife jokes, she says, what, I was a cow, is that what you're saying? I was a cow in your dreams, man. The, the reason why I tell that story, the, re the reason why I, I tell that story is to highlight in a mundane, or not mundane to me, but mundane maybe to you, a mundane example of relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to leave you with two particular points with regards to Gaza and Palestine. It's okay to feel fear about speaking out for Palestine. It's okay to be worried about the struggle. It's okay to hesitate. Because Musa alayhi salam in Surah Taha needs six reassurances before he goes to Pharaoh. Musa alayhi salam speaks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is shown ayatun al-kubra, two major signs. Now I was 16 when I first read Surah Taha. So don't judge me on the reaction. I was 16. I like to think I'm mature now. But when I thought of myself, if I'd ever spoken to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and received two signs, you'd think if Allah tells you to do something, you'd go and do it straight away. Not Musa alayhi salam. Musa turns around and says, Ya Allah, I have a stutter. And I went, ooh, Musa, you're playing it a bit. <laughs> but I realized the problem was not Musa alayhi salam, the problem was me and my perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah responds with, to Musa's dua, Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri, wahlul uqta tam min lisani yafqaw qawli. And I think, okay, Allah said the stutter's not a problem. But then you read the next request. Allah, I know you showed me two signs and I spoke to you and you played my stutter, but I don't want to go alone. Send with me Harun. And as a 16 year old, 16 year old, I went, Stah for Allah. He has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants his brother to go with him. Yani his brother is, gives him comfort in a way Allah doesn't. I realize the problem is my perception of Allah. Allah responds to him and says, Qala qad su'laka ya Musa. We've given you Harun. And don't forget, Musa, this is the first time we showed favor on you. We were the ones who told your mother to put you in the river and to keep. And you were raised in Pharaoh, tusna ala you were under my protection, under my cover. So you think at this point, Musa alayhi salam is ready to go to Pharaoh. He has Harun, his stut is remedied, he's talking talk to Allah, he's seen two signs. Now imagine my reaction as a 16 year old, when both Harun and Musa turn around and say, Allah, we're both too scared to go to Pharaoh. <laughs> and I realized the problem was, I didn't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he says, قَالَ لَا تَخَافَ إِنَّنِي مَعَكُمَا أَسْمَعُ وَأَرَى I'm with you, I see and I hear. And then Musa alayhi salam, when he sees the signs and he's facing off against the sorcerers, Allah says in Surah Taha, فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِهِ خِيفَةً مُوسَى Musa has spoken to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seen the signs, had his stutter, the stutter was deemed not to be a problem. Harun with him as well. And they both said we're scared. And still when he has all these signs and knows Allah is with him, still he feels scared. It's not wrong to feel fear to speak about Palestine. It's not wrong to be hesitant to speak about Palestine. It's not wrong to feel that when is this victory going to come? For Allah says that the, the Sahaba and the Prophet Zulzilu hatta yaqula rasula wal ladheena amanu ma'ahu mata nasrullah that they were shaken until the Prophet and the Sahaba would say, when is the victory of Allah coming? Based on their analysis of the situation after Badr and Uhud and Khandaq and Hudaybiyah, they said, when is this victory coming? We've been fighting for so long for this particular victory. It's not coming. The difference between the, oh, that Musa salam, and us, however, is what Musa did with that fear and what we do with that fear. When Nuh complains that the people aren't listening to him, Nuh doesn't actually stop giving da'wah even though he feels it's becoming fruitless. Musa salam, doesn't stop moving even though he's feeling all this fear. Even after the reassurances, he keeps going. When Musa salam, and Bani Sayyid are fleeing from Pharaoh, think about it, again, 16 year old reading the Quran. Now when you're fleeing from somebody, where do you go? You go to the hills, you go to the mountains. Who goes to the sea? No, honestly, if I told you, let's run away from the, the coming together, who would run to the sea? When Allah tells Musa, Musa goes, and when he actually gets to the sea, Ben Israel says, Musa, why the sea? What brought you here? 
But Musa alayhi because he trusts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah will deliver an outcome that he doesn't see. And that's the point in that the Quran tells you that it's okay to feel that fear. It's okay to feel that hesitancy. And this is where it brings me to the final point here, which is to address the issue of the fatigue. Ibadallah, if you are pursuing the case of Palestine on the basis that you want to see the outcome in your lifetime, then know that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, died before Al-Quds was liberated. For those of you who believe that you will only move on the basis that you will see Quds liberated in your lifetime, remember the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did not live to see Islam to be given da'wah in English. For those of you who, want, who be, will only mobilize on the basis that you see the outcome in your lifetime, know that Musab ibn Umayr anhu who made Medina Muslim, died before the Prophet ﷺ could even enter Mecca. For those of you who believe you will, only mo you will only mobilize on the basis that you will see the outcome in your lifetime, know that Sumayyah had died before the Prophet ﷺ could even give da'wah in public. For those of you who believe you will only mobilize on the basis that you have to see the outcome and people must celebrate you and clap for you, Remember that Hamza anhu died in Uhud in the battle where the Muslims were defeated. He left the Prophet in a state of defeat in the battle of Uhud. Does any of you dare to say any of these Sahaba failed? Or that the Prophet failed by not seeing Quds liberated? Why? When the Prophet Muhammad was asked by the angels, and every Prophet is asked this before they go to Jannah, do you want to stay in this dunya until the end of days to see the fruits of your outcome or do you want to go back to Allah and Jannah? Why does every Prophet say, I want to go back? Because they understood emphatically that Allah has a monopoly on the outcome that He does not share with anyone. They understood that they were sent as vehicles, as warners from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah would decide the outcome. Do you know the only prophet who leaves his people, doesn't convince his people, but their people are not destroyed? It's Yunus alayhi salam. Yunus alayhi salam gives da'wah to his people and gets so frustrated that he leaves. He abandons it, the da'wah, in a way that Nuh didn't. When Yunus alayhi salam is swallowed by the whale, when he comes out, he finds his people guided. Because the story of Yunus is Allah saying, Ya ibadallah, never think for a second that the Muslims are doing Allah a favor. Know that the honor is not in Muslims honoring Allah by giving da'wah. Know it is that Allah has honored the Muslims by allowing them an opportunity to be the vehicles through which da'wah is given, to be vehicles through which to mobilize, seeking Allah's pleasure in the mobilization. For Allah has already decided the outcome. He's already decided the timing. He's already decided how it will be done. He's already decided where it will be implemented. He's already determined these affairs. The choice that's left to you is not the outcome. The choice is whether you want to jostle to be a vehicle through which Allah delivers that outcome. When Allah told Bani Israel and Musa, go to Jerusalem, enter it and it will be given to you. They said to Musa, we will not enter it because there is Qawm and Jabbarin there. They are really powerful people. There's no way we can beat them or defeat them. And they told him, Idhab anta, that he said to them, Allah has promised it to you. They told him, Idhab anta wa rabbuka faqatila. If Allah has said it, go you and your Lord and fight. We will be here waiting for your victory. Allah said he forbade it for them 40 years because they chose not to strive. So Allah refused to give them the outcome that he had decreed. And he waited for a generation to pass away and see if the new generation would choose to respond to the call. Ibad Allah, the reason why I emphasize the idea of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being in charge of the outcome is because when you're pursuing the cause for Palestine, if you're pursuing it on the basis you want to see Quds liberate in your, life, in your lifetime, then stop now. Because in this, there is a suggestion that you want to share in the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has said only belongs to him. Ibadallah, sometimes when the Ummah reads about Musab ibn Umair, if I was to say to you, would you be happy to be a Musab ibn Umair to die before the opening of Mecca? Or would you rather be one of the newly converted Muslims when they entered Mecca? Many of you will say we'd rather see the celebration than be the footnote. That's the way you would see it. Musa ibn Umair is in Firdaus, but some of you would say, yeah, he's in Firdaus, but I want to go Firdaus another way. I don't want to be the one who sacrificed, I want to be the one who's on top of those who sacrifice. There is a, sub, there is a subconscious assertion 
that those who sacrifice are lower value than the ones on the podium. When you talk about Jerusalem and Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, none of you mentioned the Imams behind him or those who taught the Quran or those who revived the society that created Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi was the cherry on the cake. None of you talk about the cake itself. When you look at, I will press you just a little, just for one particular example here. Once upon a time, I also believed the Ummah to be weak. I truly did. I lived in London and I had all these theories and I said the Ummah should do this and this and this and this. Wallah, they're so wrong to this, they're so wrong to do that. And then one day I went to Bosnia. And when I went to Bosnia, and here is where I have the chance now to tell you about my Ummah. An Ummah that you should all subscribe and be part of, inshallah. It's the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I'm not making takfir here, I just realized that. But in any case, when I went to Bosnia, I learned that when the Ottomans were kicked out by the Austro-Hungarians, the Austro-Hungarians had a problem with the Muslims in Bosnia because even though the Ottomans left, they were convinced that the Europeans had entered Islam by the sword. But when the Ottomans left, these Bos Bosnians refused to give up Islam. Not only that, they kept building Masajid. So when the Yugoslavian kingdom emerged, not, don't confuse it with the communist, uh, communism, the Yugoslavian kingdom in the 1910s, 1920s, they realized that when they did the census, what do you identify as? They found that the Bosniaks would write Muslim, the Muslim Serbs would write Muslim, the Muslim Croats would write Muslim, and everybody else would write ethnicity. So they said, this is problematic. What is this identity that transcends nationalities? This is problematic for our Yugoslavian image of the Slavic people coming together. So they divided the kingdom into nine banvinas, nine provinces, and they made sure the Muslims were the minority in each one so they could not organize and mobilize together. In 1938, a communist philosopher came up with a Muslim question. They said, we have an issue with this identity of the Muslims in which they're able to transcend the ethnic boundaries. So this, the, the way they addressed the Muslim question was to execute half of the student leaders, put the rest in hard labor, shut down masajid, shut down the Islamic organizations, and ban the recitation of the Quran and the practice of Islam. All the Bosnians had to do was give up La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, and they would have had a nice comfortable life like everybody else living there. They refused to do so. A man would say, Wallah, I'm not giving up my beloved Prophet Muhammad and he would teach Quran in his basement and be executed for it. He, the, the, the woman would see the hijabis unable to go to the universities or the like, and they would say, I'm not giving up La ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah, I'm going to teach Quran, and she was executed for it. They would continue doing so until Yugoslavia broke apart and Bosnia was established. And then the Serbs would invade and say, we cannot tolerate Islam in the heart of Europe. We're going to go commit a genocide against the Muslims. Today in the heart of Europe, there is La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, the mosques are full. And all who try to remove Islam, Islam only grows stronger and stronger in the heart of Europe. Not because there was somebody on top of the podium, but because the ordinary Muslim is the one who carries Islam on their back. The ordinary Muslim who believes himself to be insignificant was so significant that not even genocide, colonization or persecution could erase Islam from the heart of Europe. You look at Turkey, I went to Turkey and I said to the Turks, I think Erdogan should lose the election. They said, why? He's gone a bit, you know, in the last two years. Maybe they need to reflect a little bit. His pragmatism is a bit too much. And he listened to me at the end. Then he said, Abi. I agree with everything you said except one thing. He said what? He said Erdogan is the product of my grandfather teaching the Quran and being executed for it. Of my grandmother teaching the hijabis who couldn't go to university, teaching them to be educated so they became smarter than the secular women. Of our people who broke the system and managed to deliver Adnan Menderes who was toppled and then delivered Erbakan who was toppled and then smashed the system and delivered Erdogan to power. Abi, it was our efforts. You, you just don't appreciate it coming from the West suited and booted to try to tell us how we should when you never struggled a day in your life. You weren't persecuted. You read Quran Adi, you don't go to prison for it. We never gave up La ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah despite the persecution, despite the colonization, despite the execution, despite the torture. We did not choose to give it up. When Heraclius said to Abu Sufyan, who are the people who follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Who are the people who deliver him to success? Abu Sufyan said, it's the ordinary people of our society. It's the ordinary people of our society. And Heraclius would reply and say, that was the way of the Prophets. The reason being, ya ibadullah, don't pursue the Palestinian cause on the basis that you want to see the outcome. Pursue the Palestinian cause on the basis that you want the greatest honor that can be bestowed upon a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is to be the vehicle that Allah uses to bring about the change and the outcome that will lead to the liberation of Al-Aqsa, the same way that Allah gave that honor to those who paved the way for Salah al-Ayyubi to take Al-Aqsa. 
if you want to pursue the Palestinian cause on the basis that you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to use you to be the key that unlocks the flood that leads to the liberation of Al-Aqsa. And for those of you who try to understand what on earth I'm talking about, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you what the greatest outcome is in the life of a Muslim. And you realize it's nothing actually to do with the dunya. Because this dunya will be destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You realize it's actually in one of the shorter surahs. Which is that the greatest honor a Muslim can achieve is that after a lifetime of struggle, of mobilization, of movement, of pushing through the heartbreak, you've all seen the pictures of the kids with their legs amputated. Pushing through the despair, you've all seen the rubble and the kids with their arms dangling and their legs dead and lifeless and the like. After pushing through the heartbreak, we've all seen people tell us, whisper, what's the point of talking? It's not making a difference. What's the point? Everybody is against us. What's the point? The world is against us. What's the point in mobilizing? You're going to liberate the Ummah via WhatsApp. A lifetime of pushing through that. And you keep going and you keep pushing and you keep going and you keep pushing. And Al-Aqsa is not being liberated. Bin Salman is continuing his de-Islamization. The UAE is defunding the halal economy and is opening casino and a brewery and the like. And you're seeing the world turn and turn and turn against you and the like. And you keep going. You're desperate to make a change, desperate to make a change. But you're running out of life. You're running out of aura. And then suddenly your soul is about to leave. And in that despair, you look around the world. You see everything is getting worse. You're trying your best. You're trying to mobilize. You're trying to move. You're retweeting you're doing all these other things, you're spending your money, you're doing charity, Ya Allah, I'm trying, Ya Allah, I'm trying. You're doing like Lut alayhi salam, if only I had the power. You're like Nuh alayhi salam, Allah, I tried day and night and nothing is working and the like. And as you trip over, you, think you feel your life force coming, your soul is about to leave and you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, through tears of despair that your whole life went down and you didn't achieve anything that you wanted to achieve. You kept trying, you kept mobilizing, you didn't achieve anything that you wanted to achieve. Instead, you had people like Sami telling you, keep going, keep tweeting, and you're making a difference. You say, Sami, who me? I should have done other things. The greatest outcome a servant can have is that in that moment when they die, when the soul leaves the body, you won't hear, Ya ayatuha nafsul khabitha. Oh, disgusting soul. Soul that had power but didn't do anything. Soul that was told by its prophet, convey even if it's just a verse, just talk. But they said, no, what's talking going to do? that would read in the seerah, the shift in public opinion, the Prophet ﷺ brought about in the first 13 years, but they would say, I don't want to be a Sahabi of the first 13 years. I want the glory of the last final years. Those who had money but said, why am I wasting it spending on these institutions? I'll spend it on charity, only charity, because that's a private thing. I don't want to build, I just want to give charity. The Prophet said the hand that gets his risk is more valuable than the hand that takes charity, but I flipped it because I don't trust the Ummah. You won't hear Ya'ayatu nafs al khabitha that kept telling people there's no point, it was useless. Instead, you'll hear something else. You'll hear that in the despair that you feel that you achieve nothing in your life, you'll hear the angels, they'll start saying there's a beautiful smell that is coming up, Ya Jama'ah. The angels will look at each other, they will say there is a beautiful smell that is emerging. The angel on the right side of your shoulder will say, I have all the good deeds of this soul that is written. This soul, when they told them there was no point, they kept going. When they were heartbroken, they kept moving. When they felt their despair, they wouldn't stop going. Whenever they felt that the world was against them, they said, Allah is with us, we can conquer the world. They never saw the outcome in their lifetime. They kept saying, when is victory going to come? But they kept going regardless because they believed that Allah knew where the victory was, even if they could not see it. They trusted Allah so much, oh angels, this beautiful soul you're talking about. They trusted Allah so much that even in the darkest hour, they kept moving because they didn't have any other choice to do except to believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the angels will say, Ya ayatuha nafsul mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya. Allah is pleased with you, Allah is happy with you. Fadkhuli fi ibadi, wadkhuli jannati. And the final point I want to make here, and I promise this is the final point. For those of you who are undermining public opinion, remember, I, for those of you undermining public opinion, I will say one thing here. The first 13 years of the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't have an army against Quraysh. He didn't have missiles or weapon or money or the like. Why did Quraysh keep persecuting him? Because they could not understand that despite their monies, their tanks, the missiles, the Zionist Quraysh didn't, couldn't understand that despite all of their abilities that they had, despite their superiority in what we deem to be superior, they could not understand why Umar al-Khattab would leave the elite of Quraysh or the, and come and join the Muslims, the persecuted Muslims. They could not understand why Musa ibn Umayr would leave the elites of Quraysh to come and join the Muslims. They could not understand why Zionist people in America would go and join the, 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 the elites would go and join the Muslims. 
They could not understand because public opinion matters, the haq matters, because it leads to a series of consequences that leads to opportunities that makes Aus and Khazraj turn up and say to the Prophet Muhammad though you have no power, though you have no army, though you have no money, though you have no wealth, we're ready to give everything for you in order to deliver the haq. And this is the scenario that I leave you with, and I, I'm going to hand over here because there might be question and answer, though I might have gone overboard. This is the scenario I imagine for those of you who, for those of you who believe that perhaps Sammy was sending us a dream and telling us keep going even though we won't achieve anything. Here's the scenario I imagine and I leave you with this one. It's my favorite scenario. It's inspired by the Jannah series by Omar Suleiman. When I was growing up, I always felt I wasn't deserving of Jannah. So hellfire would scare me to the first Jannah. And then Firdos, you know, it's not for people like me. And then I saw the Jannah series and I saw how Firdos was described. I said, no, 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 I want a piece of this. I imagine that one day, inshallah, if Allah blesses us all and we enter Firdos with Sheikh Ammar Shukri and, and, and the like, and he'll roar in front of us, inshallah. And we enter and we see the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says salamu alaykum we say wa alaykum salam and we see Salah ad-Din Ayyubi talk to Umar ibn Khattab and he's saying Ya Rasulullah when I entered Al-Aqsa we finally achieved it we did this and I'm looking with envy that he liberated Al-Aqsa and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say which generation are you? We say Ya Rasulullah I was from a pathetic generation we broke Israel's monopoly on the narrative but didn't do much beyond that we let Iggy Azalea and Riyadh, we let you know, Nicki Minaj come, we let all these other things. Ya Rasulullah, we couldn't do anything. And we have even had Imams who said that it's fine as long as we can do Umrah in Mecca, Medina. Ya Rasulullah, we are a pathetic generation, I didn't achieve much. And when we sit next to Rasulullah, and I'll be going, Ya Rasulullah, I tried, 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 until I became a meme. <laughs> and then you sit down, and it'll be really depressing. And then two people will come, inshallah, after us. And then they will say, Salaamu Alaikum Wa Alaikum Salaam. And then they will say, which generation are you? Ya Rasulullah, we're the generation liberated Al-Aqsa after Salah Adin for the third time. And this is what I like to imagine. I like to imagine before they sit down, they will do this. Ya Rasulullah, we liberated Al-Aqsa. Allah, send me. <laughs> and I'll be like, do I know you? Send me, I saw you thinking Muslim podcast when I was a kid. <laughs> Wallahi, you kept telling me the outcome belongs to Allah, the outcome belongs to Allah. So I kept going. I was broke, but I kept going. I was heartbroken, but I kept going. I had despair, but I kept going. But you know, the opportunities, like you said, Sammy, they kept coming one by one by one by one. And suddenly I found myself able to liberate Al-Aqsa. We did it. We gave the, Ya Rasulullah, if it wasn't for him being a Larabo rouser on the microphone, Ya Rasulullah, I probably would never have achieved it. And I imagine Rasulullah saying, you see, every soul has a purpose. Every soul has a purpose. Share this scenario with me, Ya Ibadallah. And we will keep going for Palestine. We keep raising our voices for Palestine. We keep shouting. Allah has decided the outcome, whether it's our generation or the next generation, it doesn't matter because what makes them so upset is 1400 years they persecute, colonize, torture, and the like. But this Ummah refuses to die. I'm not entirely sure that boycotting Hajj and Umrah is a good thing and I'll explain to you why. One, Hajj is a fard by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't matter who rules it. Second thing is, I don't know if you guys, I know here American branding is wonderful, so you branded handball as football. But in the UK we brand things properly, we, you know, like football is actually football. So there's a football, the Ballon d'Or in football, the best player in the world last year, was a player called Karim Benzema, Algerian. So Karim Benzema moved to go play in Saudi Arabia. When he went to play in Saudi Arabia, he had two choices, to play in Riyadh or to play in Jeddah. So he decided to play in Jeddah and then he gave an interview to The Athletic, which is a prominent, sisters for those, it's a really good, wonderful analysis of football and sports. <laughs> so uh, I, don't, I don't finish my morning unless I've read the articles there. So uh, yeah, I'm a mad fan of it. So when Karim Benzema went to Jeddah, they asked him, why did you go to Saudi Arabia? Why did you go to Jeddah? And he said, I went to Jeddah because I'm Muslim and I want to be close to Mecca and Medina. And the uh, pro bin Salman Twitter accounts went wild. Why is it, what, or is all Saudi has is Mecca and Medina? Well, he hasn't received the script, like well, he's getting paid all this money and he doesn't understand what his purpose is. The thing is, it hurts bin Salman's followers that more people go to Mecca and Medina than they go to Iggy Azalea's twerking concert, stuff for Allah. I mean, but go to, to the concert. It hurts bin Salman's followers that more people go to Mecca and Medina and go for the religious aspects rather than going to the Red Sea Resort and this kind of thing as well. So I'm actually not in favor of, of, of people not going to Umrah. I appreciate some of us can't go, but when you do go in front of the Kaaba, please make dua that one day I will get to see you again.
Let's imagine we have Bin Salman's advisors and we open a map. To our north, we see 23 pro-Iran militias that have fired rockets at the royal palace. And they dominate the government in Baghdad, they dominate Iraq. To our east, we have Iran mainland. To the south, we have the Houthis who have filed on oil facilities before and the Americans have demonstrated they're not willing to come to our protection when the Houthis fire those missiles. In 2015, because of the low oil price, when the Americans were competing with me on oil price, they brought the oil price so low that I burned through one sixth of my treasury in one year, meaning I was going to be bankrupt within six years if the price continued to stay at that basis. I have an economic crisis and I have a, a, a security crisis that I desperately need to resolve. Now, I can't trust the Muslim states because in 2003, a leaked recording from the Qatari Prime Minister said that after 9-11, the, the Americans were drawing up a list of countries to invade. One of them was Saudi Arabia and the Qataris were sort of getting ready to facilitate the division of Saudi into five countries. The Qatari Prime Minister said it was taken out of context, but the point being is that Saudi believes that the Gulf states, if there's any attack on Saudi, the planes will take off from the Gulf states, they won't take off from elsewhere. So Bin Salman says, with all due respect, my Yemeni sister, I have more important priorities than the Palestinians. And not only that, when Qatar became the first country that willingly normalized with Israel in 1996, for those who don't know, long story short, the Emir goes to get uh, medical treatment in Switzerland. The son calls him and says, Father, don't come back. I've done a coup. The father calls Saudi and UAE says, please restore me to power. My son has done a coup. The Saudis get ready to invade. They say we can't have a system where sons top with their fathers. And then the Qatari Emir calls the Americans, said, listen, if you get the Saudis off my back, I promise to normalize with Israel, set up an economic office in Doha. And I promise to give you the biggest US military base in the region. Americans get excited. They rush in. They tell the Saudis, don't you dare invade Qatar. And Qatar becomes the first. Bin Salman says the Ummah makes excuses for Qatar because they have religious scholars and Al Jazeera talks about Palestine while having normalized. If they make excuses for Qatar, why can't they make excuses for me? UAE saw that Qatar benefited. They said the Ummah makes excuses for Qatar. Let me normalize as well because as the Qatari Prime Minister said, when Arabs get close to the Israelis, it's not because they like the Israelis, it's because they believe the Israelis are the key to the Congress and the White House. And since UAE has normalized, Congress doesn't talk about Sudan where there's a rampaging genocidal militia backed by the UAE, which the UAE is supporting because it absolutely believes that if Sudanese vote, they will vote for, in the words of Bin Zayed, a 1400-year-old book to be a constitution and therefore these people should not be allowed to vote. The UAE believes that because normalization is so valuable to Congress, what it does in Yemen, what it does in Sudan, what it does in Libya, Congress says turn a blind eye because we don't want to risk normalization. Bin Salman says people still go for holiday in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and they go and pray in Sheikh Zayed Mosque and they take pictures and selfies of themselves. They say this is a lovely place to raise a Muslim family. They don't care what UAE does abroad. I also have scholars as well. When Qatar introduced alcohol in the World Cup, certain sections, certain, certain areas, Ummah didn't make any, uh, any uproar. Why don't I introduce alcohol in Saudi Arabia and do the same thing next year? Now UAE is doing a brewery. Bin Salman says, I need the Americans to push back against the Iranians. There's no issue where Israel threatens me. There are three borders where Iran is threatening me. If I normalize with Israel, then the Americans will come and protect me from Iran. They'll protect me from those militias. And I'm not ready to jeopardize that for the sake of Palestinians who, according to the Saudis, we gave them money, we supported them, and they turned out to be angry. <laughs> <laughs> Can't believe it. That's the position of, of the Saudis. The point is they believe that even, even Turkey, Erdogan says, I'm struggling in the Mediterranean. I've got economic crisis. I need resources. I need a gas pipeline. They're going to do Middle East corridor through Saudi and UAE. Yeah, Israel, please don't do it through Saudi UAE. Please do it through me. I'm more better. Remember, I was the first Muslim country to recognize Israel. I've never done anything like Saudi cutting off oil. I've never done anything like invade like Egypt did. When I kicked out the Israeli ambassador, it wasn't because of Palestine. It was because nine Turks were killed on the flotilla. Don't touch the Turks. You can touch Palestinians, but don't touch the Turks. Otherwise, that's when we might take action or the like. We want peace. We can't work with Netanyahu, but we're ready to work with the Israelis. And that's why they all believe there are certain specific interests where they want to see the outcome. They don't believe the outcome necessarily. In an outcome they don't see, they want to see an outcome that they see. And they believe Palestine is not worth. And the final point, I promise final point, is, is they believe, this is the darkest thing, that Palestinians are not going anywhere anyway. 20,000 will die, there's still another 1.5 million anyway. They're going to stay. Netanyahu is not going to get his way. So I'm not going to jeopardize my ties with the Israelis. And later on, later on, the Ummah is fickle. Just like they don't complain about Qatar or UAE or Saudi. In a few years time, I'll make some grand stance against US or the like, and the Ummah will come and say, go on bin Salman. I'm going to try to answer this question in a way that doesn't make me sound callous. 
When I went to San Francisco, I finished giving a talk and then I came out and then I was sitting with some students. And one of them asked me, Sammy, how are you finding the boycott for the sake of Palestine? And I said, look, to be honest, I can't lie to you. It's a bit hard. They said, why? I said, I've got no, I've got no problem boycotting. But yeah, like, where are the Muslim alternatives? Like, I wanted to buy Timberlands. And I can't find the alternative. I know it sounds like, you know, like a tiny little, but Timberlands are much cheaper here than they are in the UK. But, but the point that I'm saying is that I could find a Zionist company in every single industry. I couldn't find a Muslim company in every single industry. So when we're boycotting, Muslim companies should be benefiting, but we don't have Muslim companies to benefit. So, and for those who say Sammy made a big deal over Timberlands, let me tell you something. Haq is not always done with a heart that is at peace. And the proof is that in the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and for those who say how dare he bring seerah for Timberlands, I'm not someone who believes that Islam is only for grand things. I believe Allah can be asked for even the most mundane things because Allah says, Ud'uni astajib lakum. As I said when I got married, I said, Ya Allah, give me any sign like Musa and Zakaria. I don't want the feeling sign. I want the, the proper, you know, something clear. So one of the things is that when it came to, when the Prophet ﷺ was leaving Mecca, Allah told him leave Mecca. Allah has given him an order to leave Mecca. But still when he leaves Mecca, he turns around, looks at Mecca and says, Wallahi, you are the dearest land to me. And if your people had not driven me out, I would never have left you. This is despite knowing Allah has ordered. So he was heartbroken while following Allah's order. I feel a bit of discomfort giving up Timberlands. The point is, we talk about charity and giving charity or the like. First thing to note is that we're giving a lot of charity for Gaza, but 80% of it is stuck on the Rafah crossing. So a lot of it is actually perishing before it even gets to Gaza. The second thing worth noting is Gaza has exposed that as a community, we have a lot of holes. Because one, when the Prophet Muhammad said that Allah loves the hand that gets this risk on its own, and that hand is better than the charity. What we did, what we did was that Allah, Prophet said for those who are here, Allah loves the hand that gets this risk, and that hand is better than the hand that takes charity. What we did as an ummah, the modern day ummah is, we sort, of, we sort of went to the hadith and we went, sorry, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, okay. I get the, I get the signal, yeah, mukhraj, yeah. <laughs> so, what we did to the hadith was, the modern ummah, I'm not saying the ummah of the past, we sort of looked at the hadith and went, Ya Rasulullah, this is a nice hadith, but we want to add to it. It's not just any hand, Ya Rasulullah. It's that Allah loves the hand that gets his risk from engineering, law, and medicine. Ya Rasulullah, do you, do you want me to say to my brother, whose daughter is a surgeon, that my son makes shoes? Do you want me to look my family in the face and tell them that my son makes shirts for Sami because he doesn't want to buy Marks and Spencer, he wants, to buy, he wants to buy from a Muslim company, but you want me to look my family in the face and tell them my son makes shirts? Ya Rasulullah, there is, there is what Allah likes, but also I have to be careful about what people like as well. You know, there's what Allah likes, but what that's essentially what's being... The, the reason why I'm answering the question this way is, MashaAllah, I can't lie to you, American Muslims have resources. Allahumma la hasad. But you do, MashaAllah. But I do feel like, you know, Prophet ﷺ said, this is the hand of risk, and you've sort of done it like this. You've elevated the charity hand over the risk hand, because you don't want to trust Muslims in their initiatives. The Zionists, for example, will invest 10 times in a failure because on the 11th time, that failure creates Google. They will invest 14 times and the guy will blow, or, or the, the sister will blow the, 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 the opportunity maybe 14 times. On the 15th time, they create Tesla. And then everybody will say, Masha'Allah, you know he failed 14 times, but Allah gave him the 50 times because he continued. Whereas in reality, when he failed the first thing, he went, Allah, Sam, you wasted all that money here. I'm never investing in you again. The point is that sometimes I feel as a community, we embody the traits, the opposite traits of what we celebrate in the seerah. For example, when the Prophet sends Khalid ibn Walid to a tribe, Khalid ibn Walid transgresses عنه, and some civilians are killed in the process. The Prophet turns around and he says, Allahumma inni abra'u ilayka mimma fa'ala Khalid. Allah, I'm innocent of what Khalid has done. I promise you that 99% of the ummah, if they were alive at the time of the Prophet and saw and heard what the Prophet said about Khalid, they would never allow Khalid to lead an army again. They would have said, you're cancelled. Did you not see what the Prophet said about you? We will never trust you again. When in Uhud, they, they, they disobeyed orders and which resulted in defeat. Allah said to the Prophet ﷺ, If you are hard on them and punish them hardly for their failure, because they wanted the dunya, they would have fled from you. Fa'fu anhum, so pardon them. Ask me to forgive them. And here's the curveball. 
وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Bring them back into your consultation. So bring the failures and consult with them in the next step. And as if Allah knew, you'd say, why would I bring somebody who failed into my consultation? He says, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Once you've agreed on something, put your trust in me to make sure that they won't ruin your future project. We read this in seerah and we go, مَا شَاء Allah. Do you want to hear what I read about in the seerah? But in your, da in your daily lives, you would never implement it. You would implement the exact opposite. And then you ask why the power of the ummah remains locked. It's these things that unlock the power of the ummah. The question was about, you know, investing in our children's future or in the orphans. Invest in charity, but recognize that Allah loves the hand that gets his rizq. Ibadullah, the Zionists, the reason they're so powerful is because they have a wider pool of money to draw on because they don't underestimate any industry. They go in and they invest in those industries and they dominate in those industries as well. And that's why they're able to do, and not only that, they support each other even though they have differences. They buy from each other because they want to elevate each other. We go to Muslim, we say, your biryani was poor, the Zionists made it better than you, I'm going over there. You're like, yeah, at least tell me what was wrong with the biryani so I can fix it. No, nah, you should have known, yeah, I'm not expert in biryani, you should know it. We need quality produce in this ummah. Like, we, the, and, and this is the thing, there's an ayah, and I finish on this point, where Allah says that Sahaba, al kuffari, they are tough on the oppressors and repressors, but merciful between themselves. Sometimes I feel the ummah is the opposite, that we are tough on each other, but we make a thousand excuses for red pill people, for example, whenever they make a mistake. I believe that when the Prophet ﷺ gave his final khutbah, if you notice what he said, a lot of it was about the personal issues. And we believe that to be because it was about spiritual. No, it's the personal issues that build nations and states. And this is the hadith I finish on. Amr ibn As عنه, was once an enemy of Islam. But the way the Prophet ﷺ forgave him and encouraged him and incorporated him in Islam was such that Amr ibn As became convinced that he was the dearest person to the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So he said, I'm going to go ask him. So he went and asked him, he said, Ya Rasulullah, who is the dearest person to you? He was convinced it was him. And he said, it's Aisha anha. Brothers, his wife was the dearest person. I'm just saying, all those wife jokes, but be careful. And he said, amongst the men, he said her father. And after her father, Umar. And after Umar, Uthman. And he realized he didn't even make the top 10. The point of the hadith is, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so, had the capacity for accepting human beings for who they are and lifting them up when they trip over and forgiving them because he knew that Allah would protect him from the evils of when of human beings that he said I will embrace them even with their flaws and it was Amr ibn As who took Islam to Egypt. Ibadullah when the ummah is ready to and, and, and I promise this fine example I give sometimes I feel you know when community leaders take initiatives we are a lot like Ben Israel we are like, اذهب أنت وربك. show me a victory first and then I'll come with you on the initiative. Show me first your strategy is going to work and then I'll join you. And he says, yeah, I don't know like, if it's going to work, but I need your support. No, 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 I'm not putting my money. Like, what do you think I am? And so Allah prevents us from succeeding in these initiatives. I think when we become an ummah that says, you know what? Just like the Prophet ﷺ when he walked out in Badr and he turned around to his army before he gets to the battle and he says, Ashiru alayya, advise me. And the Ansar, Sad Mu'ad says, as if you're talking to us, Ya Rasulullah, as if you're seeking reassurance from us. This is the Prophet. And he says, and if I am? And Sad Mu'ad says, Ya Rasulullah, whether you win or lose, we have sworn to have your back and to stay with you. When your community leaders tell you that I want to punish genocide Joe and I need you to stand with me, are you an ummah that's saying, Bismillah, we're with you, let's see what we can do. Are you an ummah that's saying, wait, show me a victory first and then I'll go with you. Don't complain about the state of an ummah when you're doing the opposite of the ummah that you claim to love. I didn't say vote for Trump. What I said was this. Some people are asking who should we vote for? That's the wrong question. Why are the Zionists considered powerful in American politics? It's not because they deliver candidates. If it was that they delivered candidates, then the candidate would win and then betray them the way that Bush betrayed the Muslims when they delivered him in Florida. The power of the Zionists is in their ability to punish candidates. That if you do something the Zionists don't like, they will throw every resource to topple you and then discuss what to do afterwards. The Muslims have never been able to show a power to punish a candidate. The only other minority with the ability to punish is the Black Caucasus. 
This is the first time in American history where as a result of the swing states where the Muslims are concentrated in, the Muslims now have the ability to punish. It doesn't matter who comes after. The point is you set a precedent that you go from being a minority that they only visit on Eid to a minority that is feared like the Zionists because you finally showed the ability to punish. Right now when the congressperson comes to visit you, they don't research what Muslim or Islam is. They sit in the car and ask their secretary, what can I say to make these Muslims like me? And the secretary will go, they have a greeting, it's as salam as alaykum. So the guy will say, okay, as So he stands here in the masjid and he goes, as alaykum. Everybody goes, oh, do you see? MashaAllah, you know, it's as salamu alaykum, as alaykum, as alaykum, okay. They might come in and they say, Mubarak Eid. And you say, it's Eid Mubarak, but thank you very much for, you know. I think, I think, that if they knew that the Muslim vote toppled a sitting U.S. president, I would not be surprised if Sheikh Ammar Shukri invites me for Ramadan next year and I pray to Hajjud with you here and I find the congressperson praying to Hajjud with us. I would, not, I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised if I went to Michigan and I find the congressperson standing in Dearborn saying, no, this time he's come outside of Ramadan and Eid. He comes in, stands up and he says, and you know, we got to stick together because you know, as the Prophet Muhammad said, <laughs> you know? I would not be surprised if some commentators learned half of Surah Fatiha because they will know that the Muslims punished a sitting US president. Now consider the alternative, which is that the Muslim had the power to punish Biden but chose not to because they're worried about the Muslim ban. Because genocide, okay, 20,000 Palestinians got killed, but yeah, Muslim ban. You know, 20,000 Palestinians got killed, but yeah, you want me to be in discomfort in my four bedroom house? Yeah, you, you want me to watch on TV and listen to Trump and feel the discomfort in my stomach at his rhetoric? You want me to suffer that because, you know, 20,000 Palestinians got killed? They're already shuhada in the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't need to do anything in this dunya for them. There will be some imams who say that. Don't get twisted. I've heard some imams say it. I've heard some, I had an imam say to me here in the US, you know, use, don't, don't do with emotion, Sami. Though he killed 20,000, he's still the better person for us. I have a guy who committed genocide and a guy who might commit genocide. In a court of law, you condemn the genocide. Not the one who might commit a genocide. But if Biden wins when the Muslims could have punished him, let's be brutally honest. If we were advisors to a congressperson and we know that we killed 20,000 Muslims on the other side of the world and these Muslims got angry about it, but because they were worried about some discomfort, they still voted for us anyway. Are these people worth visiting? Are these people worth talking to? Are they worth more engaging with? Even when you go knock on their doors, are they worth wasting time meeting you? Yeah, go away, we can trample all over you and you'll still come and vote for us. You have no dignity. You're, and let me focus on the Zionists and the Black Caucasus, they're people of dignity. And Tuma, you guys know, we just build you a masjid and you celebrate and you get happy about it. That's why when it comes to these elections, the focus is and the views expressed are the speaker's own. You have to say no to genocide, Joe. The fact that I didn't see everybody's hand go up, may Allah, you know what? You know what? No, I'm not going to make dua against you. But I'm tempted to. The reason being is, Ya Ibad Allah, they are worried that you will manifest the power. What I always say about what Netanyahu and Blinken did is, what is the power they see in you that you don't see in yourself? Why did they mobilize all these resources to get you to be quiet? Why is it that they believe in Allah's power more than you? Why did they believe the Ummah could do something and you believe the Ummah can't do anything? Why do they believe the Ummah is capable of something and therefore billions needs to be spent to prevent the Ummah from doing it while you sit here looking me in the eye and going, Sammy, really, do we really have power? I think you're exaggerating a little bit. Why is it that I sit in a meeting with these diplomats and they're worried about Muslim public opinion and I go to my brother and I tell him, guys, I was in a meeting with the diplomats, they're worried about public opinion. Yeah, public opinion. They said it just to make you happy. Yeah, they paid a lot of money. It's not about making me happy, subhanAllah. That's the thing why I think sometimes our perspectives are flipped. They see the ummah powerful, we see the ummah as weak. And that's why I think when it comes to these elections, the Muslims have the power to punish Biden. I'm not going to sell you a false dream. Whoever wins the next election, your lives are going to be difficult. And I confess, I will feel some sympathy for you when I sit in London watching Arsenal, hopefully win the league. Because I won't suffer as much. You guys will be the ones suffering, not me. I'll be sitting in London and I'll, yeah, don't tell me Manchester United, Billah. 
The point is that I, I acknowledge that I'm not the one who's going to be suffering under Donald Trump. But I know the only people who have missed the thing when the fire is put under their feet. I believe now you've identified that. For, let's, let's take this for example. And I want to emphasis on this question because this is an important question. If I was to say to you, give me a list of five people to send to CNN tomorrow to defend the Muslims, you would struggle to come up with the list. I mean representative Muslims. I don't mean, you know, the ones, half-baked ones where we're like, that's all we got. The Zionist has a list of 200 people ready to send. If I was to say to you, what's your strategy for September to wake up the Ummah that might forget that a genocide took place? Do you have a strategy? No, the Zionist is already ready. If I was to say to you, do we have, you know, the, 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 the social media hashtags, are they ready? No. Do you know the areas here in Texas where you can make a difference? I saw some areas in Texas. Astaghfirullah, may Allah forgive you. You guys need to make toba. Not you, but some people. I've seen some areas where a candidate wins by 2,000, 3,000 votes in an area where there are 15,000 Muslims, where only 3,000 Muslims went to vote. That means if another 3,000 Muslims went to vote, they would have decided which candidate would have won. And then the Muslim dares to say to me, tell me the system is rigged against us. You didn't even try. I had somebody say to me, Wallahi, Sammy, every time we vote, we get representatives like, I don't know, X and Y. I'm not going to name their names, though. You know who I'm talking about. And I was like to them, but when you put the question when we always vote, you act like you've always had this ability. It's a new phenomenon that has been presented to you on the backs of the efforts of those who came before us, who won the battles that we don't need to fight today. They came and established these havens for us to speak in. They set the pedestal for us. And instead of us saying, we take the baton and let's go forward and make the difference, we took the baton and went, yeah, I'm not sure. And then you say, what? <laughs> and then we say, why don't we have the representatives that we want? Ibadallah, that's why I said, let me tell you about my ummah. The Turks, they kept banging, 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 and then they smashed it. The Bosnians, they banging, 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 and they smashed it. The ummah is not weak. You're weak and you're projecting it on the ummah. The Ummah is strong, but it's you who's weak. Or me in particular, I'm rebuking myself first and foremost. And that's why I'm saying that even now, if I was to say to you, where are the areas where you can decide the next candidate? How many of you honestly can put their hand up and say, I know where it is? I know you do. No, no, but, but for example, like, exactly. The Zionist has a map in his home. The Zionist has a map in his home of every single area where they're ready to go. If I was to say to you, have you prepared funds to send a team to Michigan and Pennsylvania and Georgia to help out the Muslims there, to send them for one month full boarding, to help them with a campaign over there? You'll be like, no brother, that's investing in risk. I want to invest in charity. You have all these things at your disposal. That it's like when I come from London, look, it's like you choose not to do it. And then you say, why is the Ummah the way it is? And that's why in this upcoming November, what Gaza has done is it's woken us up. Gaza exposed our power, but also our limitations. But Gaza also exposed that we actually have the resources to resolve our limitations. If only, we, and, I'll, and I'll finish on this. Did you know that if you really organize, you could actually punish Biden, according to the data that I have, you could punish Biden in the presidential election and deny Trump the House. You could, deny, you could punish Biden in the elections and you could deny Trump the House. Because at the end of the day, the Muslims are not Democrat or Republican. Ali ibn Abi Talib said that the Muslims are judged based on the causes that they follow. We don't judge a cause based on who is talking for it. We judge a man based on whether they stand with a cause. So we can be a Republican in some areas and we can be Democrat in other areas. It depends on the issues that matter to us. How many of you have reached out to the local representatives, those who called for a ceasefire, and said, what are issues in the community that we can agree on and work on together? If I even told you guys go and approach a Republican, I'd be like, <laughs> But ya ibadallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran about da'wah. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّا دَعِي إِلَى اللَّهُ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنْ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Is there any better speech than one who calls to Allah, does good deeds and say, I am from the Muslims. We read the ayah and we go, خلاص, I'm taking couscous to my neighbor. Hey, let me tell you about Islam. Which is all very good. But Allah in the following ayah tells you what da'wah really feels like. Where Allah says, وَلَا تَسْتَوِ الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةُ The good deed and the bad deed are not equal. So that means that when you do da'wah which is good, you will receive a bad reaction. Allah is telling you, don't respond the way they respond to you. Respond the way the Prophet ﷺ told you to do so. Idfa بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسِنْ Idfa here means conduct yourself in that which is best. But idfa means when you push back. Idfa push back with that which is best. Because Allah says, فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ For the one who is your enemy today 
as a result of your da'wah, tomorrow becomes your warmest ally. And Allah says, وَمَا يُلَقَاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا The ones who achieve it are the ones who are patient with the process of da'wah, patient in the face of the enmity, patient in the face of the struggle, patient in the face of the backlash. Ibadallah, sometimes I feel the ummah wants to do jihad in comfort, wants to go for good, for, for good causes but in comfort. When as soon as they feel struggle, they say, this feels wrong because I'm struggling. No, ya ibadallah. We have to struggle in these regards. And that's why I leave it to you. I'm just a guy who's come from, to be honest, I can't lie to you. I don't really know what I'm doing here. Because the initial invite was three days in LA and it somehow transformed into a four leg tour. This is the third one. The fourth one is in March, inshallah, if they let me through the border. Any lawyers here want to give me their numbers I'll, to help me out, inshallah, in case I get stuck. But in any case, the point is that I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing here, but I'm taking maximum opportunity to do one thing. I'm begging you. First, to see the power that you deployed. Second, to appreciate that power. And third, to punish that Jid Weldin Jid Bud genocide joke. <laughs> to punish genocide. I'm begging you. Because wallahi, it breaks my heart that the Muslim world could stop the genocide tomorrow, but chooses not to. The Muslim world could stop normalization and kick out the Israeli ambassador and make the Americans stop the genocide. They choose not to. But I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's as if he put power in your hands. The UK guys keep telling me, Sammy, why are you always in America? Come back here and help us. I tell no, 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 the magic is here. These guys, these guys have the ability to do it. And wallah, when I look in their eyes, I feel they don't believe me. They don't believe they have the power. Yes, I tell them, guys, I told Muhammad Jalal, I told you, Muhammad Jalal, it's February, they don't have a strategy. It's February, they don't even have the data. It's February, they don't even have the YouTube accounts ready. It's, it's February, they don't even have the hashtags ready. It's February, they don't even have the training courses ready for how to give, you know, to, to talk on the activism. It's February already and they haven't even gathered the resources to send teams to other areas, you know, to, to, to help the other strategy. Uh, the ummah is like, it's like, it's like they 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 like, yeah, 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 we want power, but they're not doing anything with it. Move, Ya Ibadallah. Move and do something. Don't be an ummah that does nothing. And Ya Ibadallah, if you try and Biden still wins, at least you have a face to show the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say to him, Ya Rasulullah, Wallah, I tried. But don't be the one. Well, to be honest, if, 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 if you don't try, then I don't know if you'll ever see the face of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's no point in doing the opposite. But the point is, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. But the point is, Ya Ibadullah, accept that Allah is in charge of the outcome and accept that Allah will fix it no matter what happens. Surah Al-Kahf, the story of Musa and Khidr. Khidr knows the unknown, Musa doesn't. Musa still keeps objecting. But Allah prevents Musa's objection from leading to a conclusion that will harm people. Musa says, why did you put the hole in the boat? The hole in the boat rescues the family. Musa does what he's ordered to do, which is to mobilize to prevent it. But Allah intervenes and makes Khidr prevent Musa from preventing it. So Allah is saying that mobilize, but trust that if you're making the mistake, I will guide you out of the mistake. Ibadallah, if, we're make, if you think Sami is guiding you to something to make a mistake, yeah, say, Ya Rabb, it sounds like a good idea, let me try it, but guide me to make sure it doesn't turn out to be a mistake. And that's belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's belief that he's in charge of the outcome. For wallahi, the prophets knew Allah was in charge of the outcome, but they still said, where is the victory of Allah? The prophets knew that Allah was in charge of the outcome, but they still said, Allah, my efforts are not resulting in anything. The prophets knew Allah was in charge of the outcome, but they still felt that difficulty and that tiredness the same way we feel. The difference between them and us is, they kept moving. Will we be an ummah that keeps moving? And Ibn Khaldun says the ummah is always one generation away from glory. One generation away because he says that the ummah has always had power. The question is whether it decides to use that power. And the only way to unlock that power is to be an ummah that is ready to mobilize without seeing the outcome because you believe it's a just cause and you believe that if you start moving, Allah will open the doors that you are unable to see right now.